Uh, all right, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming, and uh, I apologize for this rocky start uh, to this uh, talk. Um, so, um, thank you again for like showing up for this meet for this uh, session with a potentially long title that you see in front of you. Um, we're going to talk about integrating design in large corporations with diverse stakeholders, and um, <clears throat> that's pretty much the simplest way of putting it uh, in terms of what this talk is about. And let's start with uh, with about me. So you're probably asking yourself, who is this guy and why should I listen to him? I'm going to tell you. Uh, my name is Pritish Sai. I'm currently working as a UX designer for Verizon. Um, I primarily work on enterprise software and um, I've been doing that for about a year and a year and a half now. Um, I got my master's in human computer interaction from the uh, from RIT, um, and I graduated in 2020. Um, my interest primarily on enterprise software design systems uh, using AI and UX in conjunction, and uh, I love to talk about design driven startups like co companies like Canva and Swagbean. So I'm very passionate about. Uh, utilizing UX and design as a core tool to push the startup ecosystem forward. And I, and I really support uh, entrepreneurs who are also designers. So uh, those are my core interests. Uh, if you guys want to get in touch with me after this talk, uh, I have my LinkedIn profile right over there. You can also get in touch with me on Instagram and um, we can discuss design. I, I do a lot of portfolio reviews and mentorship programs as well. So like if you're anything related to UX, you can get in touch with me through my social profile. All right, cool, let's start. So we're gonna focus on four areas. The first thing that we're gonna talk about is understanding the layout of a large corporation. And uh, we're gonna talk about a diverse workforce that primarily consists of non-designers. Um, and we're gonna essentially focus on where a UX designer fits in and how they can interact with each one of these non-designer stakeholders. Then we're going to move on to understanding what is the core purpose of each stakeholder involved in the product cycle. Uh, we're going to look at their individual goals and pain points and how you as a UX designer can successfully work with each of them. So that's going to be my favorite part of the whole slideshow. Then we're essentially going to move on to how you as a UX designer can integrate yourself successfully within a large organization. I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks that I've learned working at Verizon and my previous jobs and um, tell you like how you, how you can essentially work in such a multidisciplinary organization and what are the core metrics of success as a designer. And finally, we're gonna talk about a few harsh realities of being a designer in a large and diverse corporation. And this is where we're gonna focus on a few things that, a few hard to swallow facts, but they are still facts. and. Uh, the, the, the sooner you kind of understand what they are, the, the more faster you become a, a better designer at, in, in these organizations. So let's move on. We're gonna start with the basic company layout. I wanna start, I wanna talk about a layout that is normally used in large corporations and where a UX designer can fit into this layout. Um, so this structure that you see here, varies from company to company based on how they allocate resources. In a lot of companies, the UX designer plays both the role of the researcher as well as the UI designer. But in this case, as you can see, I've broken it down into three different roles, the UX designer, the UI designer, and the user researcher. And we're primarily gonna focus on the role of the UX designer in this layout. You can clearly see that <clears throat> the UX designer interacts with every major stakeholder involved in the product cycle. That includes the, pro uh, the business owner, who in m many cases is actually the end user, the person who's gonna interact with your wireframe and give you the best feedback that you need. The product manager who oversees the project, uh, the developer who focuses on implementation, and the compliance team who supervises development of the design system, the component library, and the design guidelines. From this chart, you can see that some of the uh, stakeholders have their own internal meetings, like the business owner and the developer interacts with the project manager. And like there are certain scenarios where like two stakeholders very rarely interact, like the compliance team and project manager. And in those cases, the US designer becomes the intermediary, the middleman between the project manager and the compliance team. 
Let me give an example. Let's just say that the project manager and the business owner both require certain changes to your wireframes that conflict with the design guidelines set by the compliance team. That the compliance team normally is not going to interact with the business owner or the project manager. So in that case, you're the one who's actually going to do damage control and, so, and make sure that you're making all your stakeholders happy. If you have to compromise on the requirements one stakeholder to um, essentially accommodate the needs of the other stakeholder, you might end up doing that. So that's one of the biggest challenges of being a UX designer and multidisciplinary environment with so many different stakeholders. You are the communication channel between all of these different stakeholders in a lot of scenarios. And often that is a, that is a huge challenge. Now, what I've done is I've taken the Stanford model of design thinking and I've essentially applied which stakeholder you interact with at each section of this design thinking model. Now, in the empathize section, you're normally doing user interviews, you're doing usability testing, and you're doing surveys with legacy systems, with, with systems that essentially the company actively uses. And this is where you're getting ample feedback from your target users. That includes your business owner, your project manager, and your user researcher as well. So you're working with these three stakeholders in the empathize section of this particular model. Then you move on to the define section. And this is where you're focusing primarily on UX artifacts. You're essentially working with user researchers to synthesize data into journey maps, user flows, empathy maps, happening diagrams, and create personas, among a slew of other UX artifacts. This is basically your, your synthesis portion. You're taking your data, you're synthesizing a bunch of UX artifacts, and you're coming up with core models to understand patterns of behavior. Next comes the ideation process. And this is where you're focusing on low fidelity projects and sketches. Normally, the ideation portion of this model involves you working with your own internal design team, but you could incorporate other stakeholders as well. There isn't a rule where you need to ostracize certain stakeholders from each part of the design process. You can modify it as per your core design objectives. This is just a, a basic idea that, that we use at Verizon. And normally we don't have user researchers or UI designers. A UX designer plays the role of all three, but I've kind of broken it down to build more clarity. Then you move on to the prototyping process. And this is where you're working with all the stakeholders that are involved with the visual aspect of your core design process. The UI designer, if you have a, your own UI designer, you're working with them to make sure that the prototypes that are being pushed out to the development team are in line with your core design objectives as well as the data you get from your user research. You're also working with a developer to see the technical feasibility of, your, of the wireframes. And you're also working with the compliance team to make sure that all design guidelines set by the team are followed in the prototyping process. So, the, it, so in, pro, in prototyping, you're looking at three components, visual consistency, technical feasibility, and design guidelines. And finally, you're moving on to the testing portion of the model. This is where you're going back to your first to two stakeholders, the business owner and the project manager, who often can constitute your end users, and you're testing it. The data that you get from your testing process would actually sometimes make you backtrack back to your prototyping process and rework new iteration. So the one thing that you need to learn from this model is even though this looks linear, the Stanford model design thinking is anything but linear. Often the testing informs the prototyping, the prototyping informs the ideation, the ideation informs the testing. There are multiple ways each section informs the other section. So that's why UX design often is seen as an iterative process. There's nothing linear about designing wireframes. You're essentially going back and optimizing a previous process based on data you're getting from a subsequent process. Now, we're moving on to my favorite part of this, uh, of this presentation, understanding your stakeholders. And each stakeholder is like a different person with their own goals and pain points. And we're gonna look into each one of them. Your business owners are often your end users, but this can vary from project to project. In most situations, you're looking for user feedback from your business owners. You wanna make them happy because they're the ones who are designing your product for. Business owners are primarily concerned with KPIs that directly correlate to the business objectives. And these can include ensuring quality work products maximizing revenue and seamless workflows that increase productivity while decreasing the effort to actually implement this. As a UX designer, one of the challenges is to find a direct correlation between user satisfaction and company scalability. So it's important that you understand what are the goals of your business owner during your product discovery phase. Keep in mind that business owners who have been with the company for years 
are conflicted about switching to a UI that forces them to relearn everything from square one. So you need to be empathetic to their work history within that organization. The next st stakeholder is your project manager. Your PM is the middleman between you as a designer and the developer. Treat the PM as the voice of the development team. Again, this can vary from project to project. PMs are concerned primarily about hitting their targets within sprint cycles, which for the most part can last two weeks. PMs can be hands-on or hands-off when it comes to auditing your wireframes. They're heavily focused on making sure the wireframes are implemented in the right way. And some of the pain points are inconsistency in communication. So communication is a very important topic, which, I'll, which we will cover later in this presentation. But remember, communication is super important as, as far as your PMs are concerned. The next stakeholder is, your, is a developer. In my professional opinion, developers are the second most important stakeholders after your business owners because the final product that is shown to the end user is in the hands of the developer. Unlike designers, developers are focused less on multiple iterations of the screen and focus on implementation. One version of your wireframes. So it's important to run all your tests and user feedback sessions before you hand over your wireframes to the development team. Developing changes to wireframes is much more time consuming than prototyping them. So you need to make sure the wireframes that you send to the development team are the final ones. The next stakeholder are UI designers. So this is basically, uh, th this person applies to a company where the UI and the UX are essentially segregated among two different uh, like job roles. So the role of a UI designer can vary from company to company as well. The UI designer's primary objective is creating visually appealing prototypes that target user needs while ensuring compliance and consistency as per design guidelines and as well as the brand. Um, since the UI designer does not normally interact with the end user, which is the role of the UX designer and the user researcher, they may struggle with translating the data that is handed over to them into accurate wireframes. The visual appeal is secondary when, comp when compared to the functionality. In some cases, the UX designer works on a lo-fi wireframes, so the UI designer has a strong foundation and reference point to work off of. In some companies like Verizon, both the UX and UI designers are the same person. This reduces the friction between the user research and the prototyping. The next stakeholder is the, the user researcher. The user researcher is extensively focused on gathering data, which in most cases is qualitative from end users in a lot of companies. But in a lot of companies, the US doesn't double the user researcher as well, as we do in Verizon. The challenge with being a user researcher or working with one is that user research focuses on understanding the user needs and not company goals for the most part. As a UX designer, you need to find a way to balance both. And that's always a huge challenge. The business owner for the most part will not compromise the company objectives to accommodate more user needs. So you might end up designing wireframes that are in line with the company objectives versus satisfying all user needs. An example is accessibility. There's always a, uh, there's always a conflict of do we actually want to like postpone uh, like implementation to accommodate more accessibility into our wireframes? And that varies from project to project. But a lot of big tech companies still need to educate themselves on the importance of accessibility at, at the start of the design process. And we finally move on to the last stakeholder, the compliance team. They are in charge of building and growing both the design system and the component library. The code repository for the design component, which is basically the code repository design components. The compliance also sets design guidelines that US designers follow when designing the prototypes. These could include layouts, font sizes, button placements, content structure. It isn't uncommon for designers to conflict with the compliance team when trying to target the needs of the end user. There have been scenarios where the prototypes might have to break certain compliance guidelines to accommodate user pain points. These are completely normal and designers should not second guess their user needs. Um, I'm now gonna to talk to you about certain integration tactics that I use at Verizon to sort of successfully integrate myself as a UX designer. And we start with the, ho uh, the holy trinity of UX integration. because so this is very, very important. My mentors have often told me that prototyping and design can be learned on the job. But what really is hard to kind of build are your soft skills. So the, the holy trinity of user integration has three terms, listen, observe, and communicate. During user interviews, or usable testing sessions, where you use a thing called a protocol, you need to listen to the pain points of your end user. You have to really understand what they're telling you. You have to 
have an open mind about their issues. And you have to really highlight certain points that they bring out in, during their interaction with the prototype to really understand exactly where their pain points are. Observe. When you observe users interacting with a prototype during a usability testing session, you're understanding what their actions are and what their behavior is. And I've been in a lot of sessions where I've gotten more data from just observing users than just asking them questions. So observe, uh, when you essentially observe a user using, during a usability testing session, you're able, they're able to sort of uncover pain points that they don't normally remember. And you're able to get more data from that. So observation is extremely important for you to really isolate and extract pain points that normally you might miss through user interviews and user surveys. And finally, I think one of the most important soft skills is communication. You need to understand the language of each stakeholder and communicate with each one of them. Like designing is one thing, selling is something else. You might be an amazing UI designer and your wireframes might be revolutionary, but you might, but you have to sell them. You have to sort of like present them to stakeholders who will bring a lot of critical, critical feedback to what, to what you're doing. If you can't sell your design, then it's gonna be hard to convince the development team and any other stakeholders to implement them the way you've designed them. So communication is extremely important. It's a difference maker between good designers and great designers. So here are some key points to remember. Always defend your designs with user feedback when you get pushback from stakeholders. When stakeholders are type A personalities, you're gonna get a lot of critical feedback that might conflict with the way you actually apply design to your wireframes. You get, use the user feedback from your business owners as your weapon of choice. Use it to kind of defend your designs and showcase the relevance of changes you make to your wireframes through extensive of the user feedback. So whenever you're presenting your designs, have your user feedback on the side. So in case you get pushed back from any of your stakeholders, you can use it to kind of like build a strong case for what are wireframes that you come up with. Secondly, understand the language of each stakeholder. I'm not saying go deep into it, but understand some basics. The goal is to build empathy with each stakeholder. The developers, if you have time, just learn a bit of React, CSS, and Angular basics. It isn't that hard. You want to just understand their language a bit and understand why implementing certain wireframes is complicated for them. As far as the product manager is concerned, learn about agile process sprint cycles. This gives you an idea about their deadlines and why like, they push for certain deadlines and what their process is. If, if you're not a UI designer, I would, I would study prototyping so you can understand how your data and your research gets translated into wireframes. If you're working with a user researcher, understand research methodology so you're able to talk to them about their, re about their research process and maybe help them kind of optimize it better. And as far as your business owner is concerned, and this is very important, understand what are the business goals? What are, your, what are the core KPIs that, that relate to business objectives and, and success? Understand certain business terminology. In a company like Verizon, where we primarily work on uh, enterprise software, we have a lot of internal terminologies that, that we don't normally use in regular conversation and a lot of acronyms. So it's important to kind of understand the business terminology so that when you're sitting in meetings with product managers or other or developers or other stakeholders, like even executives, you're able to sort of follow the conversation. You're able to sort of find a correlation between the business code and the design process. Thirdly, reach out to the design community. So if you have an internal community of designers, which includes a compliance team, have weekly governance calls, get regular internal audits. And because design is always a collaborative process, you're not working in isolation. Getting feedback from your fellow designers and actually getting critical analysis from them would help you kind of optimize the entire process. Having multiple perspectives in your design process gives you an idea of how you want to go about like the evolution of your wireframes. So, Reach out to your internal design community and have weekly governance calls and have regular internal audits. Um, okay. And finally, the harsh realities of design life. Um, so UX, even though it's evolving as an industry, is still seen as UI, which is why a lot of companies when they advertise for jobs, they say UX slash UI, which, I, which, which kind of like kills me every single time I see that. And, um, but that is the truth. A lot of, um, Stakeholders don't care about the UX process. They want to see the wireframes. That's the end product. It's like if you're working as a programmer and you're, and you're pushing a product to a client, you're not going to show your code. You're going to show what, you're going to show the, the actual product. Nobody really cares about the, the back end. Nobody cares about the pieces that you need that gets you to that particular product. They want to see the product and the justification for that product. So the UX is, think of the UX as your back end for your design. 
and the UI is your front end essentially. So user feedback and metrics are a different story though. So like if you do, like I mentioned before, if you do get pushback from your stakeholders, use the user feedback and use certain metrics that you measured through your usability testing to kind of justify your design change. And, and the last two points are legacy users, as I mentioned before, will be resistant to massive changes to the UI. Legacy users are those users who've been with the company for 10 plus years and are used to a certain UX and certain UI. And they're the users who, who are afraid of like relearning the entire UI. And because they're comfortable with certain UX and UI changes that have been, there, that have been consistent with the company for years. So they will be resistant and you have to be prepared for that. And finally, accessibility needs to be promoted within large organizations. Uh, we talk a lot about accessibility in design. Unfortunately, even large companies like Google and uh, Facebook are not focusing on accessibility as much as they should. And this is something that you need to keep in mind when like starting work in a new organization. All right, so that essentially covers everything I wanted to talk. I wanna thank you guys again for coming for this session and uh, let's open the floor for a Q&A. Can you guys hear me? Hey, yeah, we can. Thanks for the presentation, Pratish. Uh, that was really informative. I hope everyone uh, learned something from it. Um, I guess, does anyone have questions? So yeah. Jasmine has a question in chat. Right. Um, Jasmine's question is, could you reiterate again what the main differences are between UX and UI? Okay, so UX essentially is everything that happens before you actually prototype your screen. So uh, your usability testing, uh, your, uh, your, your, your customer journey maps, your personas, synthesizing your data, it's everything minus the actual prototyping. UI is where you're taking all the findings from your customer journey map, from your user flows, and you're translating that into visual prototypes where you're focusing on font, color, layout, placement. And um, so UI is more of the visual aspect of design and the UX is more the research and data synthesis aspect of the design process. Uh, does that make sense? Cool, awesome, Jasmine. Um, thanks for that question. Um, Aurelia, um, um, I got a message, <laughs> sorry, Aurelia, um, about what 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 are your thoughts on, um, I guess, on working on a, for a company that does not respect the process or the thinking? Um, I wouldn't say, it doesn't respect the process of thinking. It's like every company essentially has their own process of thinking. Um, but can you like, um, can you elaborate on the question? I'm, I think I'm a little bit confused by that. I think it's just um, a general question of, um, I mean, I have some thoughts on this question actually. So maybe if, I, since I don't see anyone else um, have any immediate questions, we could transition it to like, um, a kind of like a, a more open discussion, um, but it's. Oh, Brian, hi, it's Aurelia. I just put another one in there, but I was gonna send okay. it to everyone. Um, I can elaborate on what I meant for British. Um, I think in, in your presentation, you said something like the, uh, I forget which stakeholder it was, doesn't care about your process. All they care about is the wireframes. Uh, that's, yeah. That, They'd that's be sad. Good. Uh, but that's pretty standard for a lot of companies because um, it differs. It, see, it also differs on the stakeholder themselves. Like, I work on a lot of projects. There are PMs that extensively want to know about the process, and there are PMs who don't really want to know about it. So it isn't it isn't their prerogative to really like know about it. Like, it's like for example, let's just say that I've uh, like I've outsourced a designer 
to design the wireframes for my, for essentially for my project. Uh, unless there's data in that UX process that's going to really help me build perspective, I'm, I want to focus more on the wireframes. And that's pretty standard, not just for companies, but for recruiters, but for the industry as well. Like the harsh reality is like a lot of people are going to primarily judge your UX by your UI. And I know it sounds horrible, but it's like, that's how the, that, that's how like the market is for the most part. And, 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 and you can't blame them primarily because they have, they have deadlines and they have tight schedules and UX is very time consuming for us to sort of like explain our whole UX process, like our customer journey map in terms of our, our user flows, our, our empathy maps, our affinity diagrams, it's going to take a long time for us to sort of break that. And also you have to understand they ha they're not, it's, these terms are kind of like new to them. Like maybe they use it for their own agile process, but a lot of UX artifacts like empathy maps are not primarily known to stakeholders like project managers, unless they come from a design background. And so like, Th that is the reality of it. I mean, I don't think they don't care about it. It's just that they're not inclined to really uh, focus on that as much as they want to focus on the UI. I, th I think um, where I was coming from was that may be true um, in, in, in the org, but if you're looking for a position, does that mean, you know, um, I think, you know, nowadays, I think there's a lot of opportunity out there for UX and, um, you know, what they call a great reshuffle where people are reevaluating their values and, and, you know, they don't have to work for people that don't care about the things that matter to them. So, um, but when you're looking for a job and the recruiter says, I really don't care if you did any of those UX deliverables, all I want to see is wireframes, I would feel like what they're looking for is a UI designer. Um, unfortunately, they're looking for a UX designer, but they're only looking at UI. And that sounds, it, it, it sounds weird, but the, I've seen this a lot of recruiters. A lot of recruiters are only going to focus on the UI because it's, it's visually appealing to them. The UX process is extensively content. If it's, and it's content, it's research, it's data. So like, uh, they're going to, the recruiters are going to pretend you actually care about the UX process, but you can see that they want to focus primarily on your wireframe. The person that you want to impress. So this is a process I've seen with a lot of recruiters. The person that you want to impress with your UX process is the hiring manager. Now the hiring manager normally is a designer themselves. And they're the person who's actually going to audit your entire UX process. So like this is a hack. If you can essentially explain the UX process in a way that sounds important to the recruiter, they're going to push you to the hiring manager. The recruiter's goal is just a gatekeeper. They're just going to open the gates and they're just going to sort of, you're giving them first impression. They're going to like give you like, like feedback, like, oh, that's amazing. That's fantastic. But they're looking at your wireframes because that's what they understand the most. It's like, let's just say you're playing for a software development position and, the rec and you, ex you expect the recruiter to actually understand your code. They're going to really look at the output, like the final product. And that's how, and that's how most recruiters are. If you want to really impress someone with the UX process, it's the hiring manager, the person who comes immediately after the recruiter. I think it's difficult to get to that second stage if you don't impress the recruiter, but I also have worked with recruiters, like the good recruiters, they know what they're talking about. And, you know, you don't have to BS them. That's that, I think that's what I'm saying, you know, like, but I would say they're, that I agree, they're few and far between. Yeah, I just want to add on to that as well. I think there are bad recruiters out there as well <laughs> that like, or, or maybe they're new, you know, like, um, so sometimes it it is a challenge to get past, you know, the corporate recruiters because they themselves don't really know what UX is. And, and, and like you said yourself, like UI is what most people will see and what appeals to them. So um, I think... I think the challenge for 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 us when we look for new work um, is that we have to sometimes get over a knowledge gap between um, what UX is and what the recruiters know about UX. I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, we have another question in the chat. It's um, from Wei Ling. It says, I am a UX unicorn. Who is good at all aspects of UX, UI, and development work? 
what is your advice for people like me in a large corporation? Um, first of all, congratulations. You're a rare breed. Uh, you're like pretty much like the dream hire for like most companies. Um, again, like I know, pe- I actually know people who do development and, de- and, and design. Um, but the question is like, is your qual- are you consistent in all aspects of it? Like, would you call yourself a better designer than a developer or a better developer than a designer? Uh, let, me, let me just open the chat for this, sorry. Like, uh, I mean, like, is your design work on par with the development work? Would you actually say that you're as good a designer as you are a developer? I mean, like, okay, so, okay, so you're a better designer than developer. So that means I would focus primarily on your design shop first and then your development second. And your kind of job role is much more applicable to a startup than a large company. Because in large companies like Verizon and like Google and Facebook and Airbnb, it's very rare to actually see designers do development work as well. I've not seen it. I mean, maybe it happens, but I've not seen it. But in startups, you're wearing multiple hats, primarily because of the fact that a startup is resource constrained. So if they find someone like you who does development and design, then yes, um, that's pretty much a place where you'll be valued for being a UX unicorn. But I'm not seeing UX unicorn. So it, it, So I would say like, you know, if, if, from a job perspective, I would say go for smaller companies or startups where you get more freedom to do what you want because you have those many skill sets. But if you want to focus only on one aspect of your, your, uh, about, of your skill set, which in this case is design, then I would say go for larger corporations and put more effort into being a better designer. But I'm not sure if anyone agrees with me on this, but I think it's hard to be a UX unicorn to the point where your prototypes are like, you're an amazing designer and you're an amazing developer. Like, I've not seen that with anyone. Like someone whose prototyping is as good as their code. So like, yeah, that's my advice. I hope that helps. Um, I think I would also like kind of, um, just to add on to that, I think what you could do at large corporations specifically is, you know, like augment your resume, and your your cover, whatever your submission materials are to focus uh, more on meeting the requirements of, of that job. Um, and I think it's always helpful when you're looking for work to, you know, kind of just message people on LinkedIn. See if you can get an in in another way. Yeah, another question. Okay, I think many people do lead design. It's just the so when you say redesign, uh, so this is Jasmine's question. I have I have a question. It's pretty specific. I've been roaming on the web and seeing many people do redesign case studies. I'm very curious as to how one begins to do this. Do they design it from scratch with the color scheme, font layout? Um. When you say redesign, are you, t- are you talking about taking an existing product and then completely cha- redesigning the UI? You just want to make sure I understand. Okay, got it. So you can do that. And I actually advise people to do that as well because it's easier to sell that than actually designing something from scratch. Um, but again, you need to go back to like, you know, uh, uh, you need to essentially go back to like, you know, uh, like the first uh, aspect of the UX process. You need to go back into user research. Uh, so the way I would go about it is take the existing design from the product, like let's say Spotify. You're trying to design some, you're trying to redesign a certain aspect of Spotify, like the radio section, or you want them, or you, you want to make your playlist search more discovery more easier. Just take the existing UX process get as much data as possible with the existing design, like do some usability testing sessions, do user interviews, gather user data on the systems, and then consolidate it into a series of like, um, like deliverables, and then work on the UI. So essentially a redesign case study is 
identical to a, 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 like a, a regular design case study. The only difference is you're starting with, like you're, you're, not doing, you're, you're starting with a usability testing session because normally the usability testing happens after you do the prototyping process. But in this particular case, you can start the entire process with usability testing to get a basic idea of what users' perceptions are about the uh, existing uh, application. And then you literally just follow the same process to use for, for other case studies. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, Sergius asks, uh, I learned a lot. What is the biggest hurdle working at Verizon educating users of the process? Internal terminologies. I think internal terminology is something that we often kind of like, I, I personally kind of like need to educate myself more on because when I'm sitting in, in PM meetings or when I'm sit, sitting with meetings with different stakeholders, they come up with acronyms. I'm kind of lost. And like, and in Verizon people use acronyms quite often. Um, and like, I often have to have like my documentation in the site to make sure that my person like that the, I understand what the acronym is. So I would say internal term terminology is from my that this is my personal perception. It could differ from for a different designer. It's one of the challenges. And uh, wireframing is not as I mean now I've been working for a year and a half and I started it was a bit of a challenge because I was building my shops. Now I've become more used to it. Um, I I think the biggest challenge is kind of like. It's, it's what I go back to, like keeping all your stakeholders happy, coming up with a design that, that, that your compliance team, that your developer, that your PM and your business owner is satisfied with is the biggest challenge. And we've had certain scenarios where we had to get all stakeholders into a single meeting. And that's when we kind of really highlighted the conflicts between each stakeholder in terms of like, you know, what one stakeholder wants and the other one kind of conflicts with. So that resolution between multiple stakeholders with your wireframes, I think is one of the biggest challenges. I hope that answers your question. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, Brian, should I stop sharing? Uh, yeah, I think, I think we're cool then. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna stop the recording here. So stop.